Today on Blue 58, we're talking about ACL injuries. It's one of the most noteworthy injuries in all of football. So how do you fix it? And what should we be looking for from the guys currently recovering from that injury on the Packers? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink, and I am happy to be with you here for another episode. Talking injuries is a necessary part of covering football. It's part of the game. It's something that's going to affect your team one way or another sooner or later. So it pays to know what's going on. And I've tried to do a little bit more injury-related stuff over the past couple of years. And we're doing a little bit more of that today. We're talking to Matt Ellison, who knows his way around the inside of a knee about as well as anybody possibly could. And he's here to share a little bit about what goes into ACL surgery and recovery from the perspective of a doctor. I personally don't know anything about how knees work other than sometimes my knees hurt, sometimes they feel good, sometimes they feel bad, but they always affect how I operate on a day-to-day basis. And Matt's going to tell us a little bit more about what goes into that, especially recovering from an ACL injury, as so many guys in recent Green Bay Packers history have. So I'll step out of the way and let Matt do some explaining now. Uh, Give it a listen. So Matt, normally when I do an interview like this, I like to introduce people's credentials up front, but just because we're talking about things related to medicine and medical stuff, why don't you give me your credentials and why you know what you know about ACLs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I have a doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. Um, I currently don't work in a sports setting, but uh, I do a lot of knee rehab, uh, mostly total knees, which if you've done a lot of total knees and ACLs, you know, it's not too different. Um, I also spend 14 weeks of my clinical internship um, at Champion uh, Performance and Physical Therapy out in Boston with Mike Reinold and Lenny Macrina, um, two kind of big names in the PT world, uh, well known for a lot of the stuff they publish on um, ACL rehab. So uh, yeah, that's kind of my background. And just to make sure we define all of our terms, when we talk about an ACL, what are we talking about? What is it? Yeah, great question. Um, So I think setting the stage with a little anatomy is always helpful. Um, If you think about the knee joint, we're talking about the femur and the tibia, right? The femur being that big long bone in in the thigh, the tibia being that platform uh, that that femur sits on. The ACL sits right between those two, kind of between the knuckles of the femur sitting on that tibial plateau. Uh, That's the anterior cruciate ligament, the PCL being the posterior cruciate ligament. Then you also have the MCL, the LCL, uh, medial collateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament, and then the meniscus as well. So all stabilizing things that kind of keep that femur in place on that tibial plateau. Just as an aside here, six years ago, Aaron Rodgers had a tibial plateau fracture that initially people thought might be an ACL injury. What is a tibial plateau fracture? Just as a quick aside. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, So that tibial plateau where that femur sits with different types of knee injuries, um, usually some type, type of strong impact, um, you can get subchondral fracturing of that tibial plateau where the bone beneath uh, all the cartilage actually uh, fractures. Um, not comfortable. Uh, r- big tibial plateau fractures are some of the most painful injuries I've seen. Um, not a lot of fun. <laughs> but um, if it's a big bony fracture, it can it can usually be stabilized pretty easily. And uh, weight bearing can kind of be hit or miss afterwards, depending on where that fracture happens. But uh, yeah, not a comfortable one from what I've seen. So sorry to already send us down a tangent here, but we'll try to get back yeah. on track. When we talk about that ACL injury from a doctor's perspective, from somebody who's going to be looking to get somebody better here, what do you see when somebody tears their ACL? What is generally what happened there? So uh, the injury itself or the, or the recovery? The injury itself. Let's start with the injury. So the uh, anterior cruciate ligament uh, resists um, uh, posterior translation of the femur relative to the tibia, right? Or internal rotation of the femur relative to the tibia or extreme hyperextension, right? So that that last one being like, if you think of Giannis in that finals run a couple of years ago, where he had that crazy hyperextension of his knee and all the armchair doctors on Twitter kind of came out and said, oh, he definitely tore his ACL, right? Um, He didn't because he's built different, but... uh, But that's kind of those three motions are what the ACL resists, right? So if you think about most of our ACLs being non-contact injuries on the field, it's usually a combination of of a couple of those motions, like a big internal rotation of the femur. And um, it's it's 
usually tends to be too much for that that uh, anterior cruciate ligament to resist. I will say also there it's a really really strong tissue, right? Um, I found a couple studies saying that the tensile force of that uh, ACL is something like 2,000 newtons or 500 pounds, right? So it takes a lot to do this. That's why it's usually some combination of those different motions that that winds up tearing that ACL. When you are watching a football game and you see a guy go down, usually in these non-contact situations, do you feel like you can usually tell that's that's probably an ACL or, or is that harder than you might think? Definitely harder than you might think. I think the other thing that, that it is important to keep in mind is usually those, these uh, accidents or these injuries don't happen in isolation, right? It's some combination of an ACL injury, a PCL injury, maybe an MCL, um, meniscus, and then even maybe some some tibial plateau involvement, right, or a chondral injury uh, where that that uh, um, cartilage is getting injured too, right? So it's usually not just one thing. Um, I will say, if you remember that Odell Beckham Jr. injury from uh, the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, that one was pretty textbook. That one was about as clear as that on-field injury can get um, to the point where like people were like zooming way in and felt like they could even see that femur shift in real time, um, which would be that ACL probably popping. That, I mean, not to put too, not, too fine a point on it, but that yeah. is disgusting. I, I, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have a big problem with blood or surgery or things like that. But watching, when people were zooming in on Aaron Rodgers, Achilles popping last year sure. or, or the, right. the, the Odell Beckham stuff, that gives me the willies. I don't know how, it, how doctors deal with stuff like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I've sat in on a couple um, uh, trauma surgeries, and I, same, same thing. Like, it's fascinating, but very glad it's not my job. So the part that is your job or, or related to the jobs you've done, when it comes to surgically repairing an ACL, what are we actually doing? What is that process like? Uh, so there's a lot of different surgeries, um, but as far as athletes go, there's pretty much one gold standard at this point, um, which is the patellar tendon autograft, right? Auto meaning from the patient, right? We're taking it from them. Patellar tendon meaning they are taking that big, a big chunk of that um, patellar tendon, which is just below the kneecap, and substituting that in for the ACL. The benefit of this for surgeons is that they can take a big bone plug from both the patella and then the tibia. So they basically take the middle third of that patellar tendon, pop out a big chunk of bone on one end, pop out a big chunk of bone on the other end. Then they can drill holes in the femur, in the tibia, and plug those right in. You get bony grafting. Um, which is really, really, really strong, and you don't have to wait for the ACL to bond or the the substitute ACL to bond to bone. It's already bonded to the bone you took it from. When you talk about the the donor tendon, there, uh, do they still use cadaver tendons? Aaron Rodgers, and uh, the third time we've mentioned Aaron Rodgers already, but he's had a lot of interesting <laughs> injuries. Yeah. He mentioned a cadaver tendon when he tore his ACL in college. Is that something they still do? Um, it's still something that like, if, if you or I tore our ACLs and, and we decided we wanted to go get an ACL replacement, that might be something that the doctors talk us through as an option for athletes. I would say not really the case these days anymore. Um, the, you know, lots of studies at this point showing that those autografts grafts from the donor or from the person having the surgery tend to do better, um, both in, uh, lower failure rates and then lower resorption rates, fascinatingly enough, um, where, with some of those uh, allografts or the, the cadaver tendons, um, some there's some literature now suggesting that in some cases the body just breaks that down as foreign tissue and resorbs it. What does that exactly mean, and how does that affect your recovery? So if that's the case, right, so for you and I, right, if, if I, we went and had an ACL surgery and then... 10 years later from now, we had another MRI that showed, hey, actually, you, you, we put an ACL in there, but there's no ACL. It would really be a matter of, like, do you notice a difference? Does your knee feel unstable? If you don't, all right, we're not going to do anything about it, right? Um, but when you're talking about athletes who are really kind of pushing the limit of what those joints can do in some instances and pushing beyond in the case of an injury, um, I think that having as much strength or as little chance of failure as you can is really, really important for the doctors and obviously really, really important for the athletes as well. So this leads me to what might be a, a dumb question here, but if your body can just say, if you if you put in this donor tendon and your body will just say, no, thank you, we'd rather not have one, uh, yeah. do you need an ACL like to, to just function as a person? Nope. So uh, like today, if I tore my ACL, I'd probably go um, non-operative or conservative, right? I'd probably just do a bunch of rehab and hope for the best. Um, 
there's no also there you know in 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 most populations there's no risk in, in not going through with the surgery you can do surgery further down the road if you hope or if you want to and i actually worked with a couple athletes at champion who had delayed uh their uh, acl replacement surgery uh and just tried to see how it would go without one and then ultimately they decided you know what, i'm doing a lot of cutting my knee still feels unstable uh, and that's where they're kind of uh that's where they're kind of um, deciding let's go ahead and get the surgery done and, and hopefully get a little bit more stability with some of these movements. So JJ and Igbari kind of made some waves earlier this off season, first with his recovery from his ACL injury. It sounds like he did not have a full tear of the ACL, but he said he just wanted to do the rehab stuff to try to get his, his knee back to where he wanted it to be. Yeah. What is, what does that entail? How, how do you go through the process of healing, not a full tear without, without surgery? Yeah. So I I think that would probably be a case where um, kind of like what I was saying, like, so instead of uh, going straight to surgery, um, you decide, well, let's see how rehab goes, Uh, probably based on, like you said, probably not a complete tear. Um, So that would be going straight into work with a physical therapist. You're certainly further down the line than you would be post-surgery because you don't have all this post-op swelling. You don't have all the trauma of the surgery itself. Uh, So you get to go right into a ton of stability work, maybe a bunch of agility work, make sure your strength is really strong on both sides. um, And then hopefully you don't notice that that knee is starting to become less stable. If it is, and then you decide to go get the surgery, well, now that potentially takes you out for a longer stretch, right? Um, So that's, I think, why a lot of professional athletes, you know, just go ahead and say, let's just do the surgery. I'm not risking it. Okay. It's it less risk doesn't maybe feel like the right word when I say it's less risky to go that route, the the non-surgical route, but it, it's less, your recovery process could go more smoothly or you're more guaranteed of a result. Is that a good way of characterizing it? I guess that if it goes well, you are way ahead in the recovery timeline than you would be post-op, right? Okay. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah. I kind of got interested in ACL stuff about almost 15 years ago now when Al Harris tore up his knee. Um, and, and he actually did something that was kind of revolutionary at the time. He posted a weekly recovery video journal on YouTube showing what his, his surgery or post-surgery process went through, all the things that he went into, all the exercises he was doing to try to get back on his feet. And the oh, thing that's that awesome. it, it was, it was fantastic and, and fascinating to watch. But the thing that stood out to me when he was doing that was the first day of his post-surgery work. So surgery's done, swelling has gone down, he's ready to get to work. And they lay him down in his stomach, and, and his, his physical therapist is saying, all right, here's how far your knee bends, and here's how far it's going to bend. And there's like a six-inch gap there. And he's like, this is where we're going to get to today. Right. It's going to happen, and it's going to hurt. And that, and yep. just watching him work through that was was fascinating. So my question there is, how important is that post-surgical work for someone who has an ACL surgery and, and what goes into that? Yeah, big, big, big deal. Um, so priority number one post-surgery is get that range of motion back, right? You've just had a ton of swelling. Um, you've just had a full-on operation. It's, it's you know, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think the, the biggest part of that is, is um, a, a lot of times you haven't moved this knee in some time pre-surgery as well, right? So that knee is very, very, very stiff. Priority number one is get back range of motion as quickly as you can. Um, that's the only thing that there's somewhat of like a, a big timeline on, right? If you miss the, the timeline on that, um, then you have all the scar tissue laid down. Things get a lot, lot tougher. Um, strength you can build at any time. Agility you can build at any time. I mean, there's some timeline with a professional athlete. They want this to be as quick as possible. But uh, motion is the one that is most important for everybody. We have to get this right out of the gate. And it's not comfortable. <laughs> Why does it hurt? I guess this is my my big question there. Why does that hurt so yeah. bad? Yeah. So I, I mean, uh, that's that's kind of a that's a tough question. That gets into a lot of uh, we can open up the Pandora's box of like pain neuroscience or not. <laughs> that might be a, a topic for another day. But um, but I think uh, why it hurts is is that knee is just very very stiff, right? You know, you're still very much in acute phase of healing in those first six to eight weeks after the surgery. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of swelling, even if it doesn't look as swollen as it did immediately post-surgery. Um, but there's a lot of swelling within the knee capsule, um, that, that surrounds the joint. Uh, it, things are very tender, right? Things are, are very much, um, kind of inflamed yet, right? There's a lot of, uh, inflammation going on. So it's, it's not fun. What I will say is if you do a bunch of the work, 
and the knee is moving better, it tends to feel a lot better. So it's kind of like a bear with it. It's going to be worth it. Looking at that timeline of recovery from the outside looking in, we can't see what people are doing. We can't see, we're obviously not their doctors. What should we be looking for on the outside? Or maybe what should we be expecting as fans? Uh, Kind of at a couple different phases here. First, like shortly after surgery, then maybe a year after surgery, then two years down the line after you've had your ACL surgery. Yeah, great question. Um, So it it varies a lot, right? And this kind of goes back to um, no two injuries are the same, right? Is the, if, does this person have a meniscus injury? Did they have a meniscal repair? Um, did they have a chondral injury, uh, maybe a tibial plateau insufficiency fracture, right? If they did have any of those things, there's probably going to be a period of non weight bearing where you, you cannot put any weight on this leg because this has to heal, right? Well, if you can't put any weight on it, that's a lot of time that you are getting very weak, A. Eh? Um, you're probably getting more stiff, right? Because you're just not moving it as frequently. Uh, and you, you, you're um, ultimately, um, uh, you know, behind the eight ball with all the other recovery stuff, right? Um, if it's just a straight ahead ACL tear, nothing else uncomplicated, um, you can weight bear right away, right? So, so uh, you can start moving a lot more quickly. Um, but those first six to eight weeks are still what we kind of consider the soft tissue healing window, right? Um, they, you know, they had to cut through a lot of tissues to get to the knee. They had to uh, pull out that patellar tendon graft. You know, that's not comfortable. That hurts a lot. <laughs> uh, then they had to bore uh, holes into the femur and the tibial plateau. That's also uncomfortable. Um, so it's it's a lot of just recovering for those first six to eight weeks um, and a lot of motion, right? Those are the big priorities. If we're talking about those bony plugs, right? Now we, we're talking about bony healing as well. That takes even longer. We're talking more like 10 to 12 weeks for that bone graft to really take hold. So you're not pushing max strength by any means for basically the first 10 to 12 weeks, something like that. And then extending that timeline out even longer, once you start looking at like a year down the road, where should you be? I'm thinking of Tyler Davis in particular here because he tore his ACL right at the end of training camp last year, like right before final cuts. I think maybe even after the third preseason game. Um, yeah, we're terrible timing, <laughs> awful timing, especially heading into yep. a contract year like he was. Right. Uh, what should he be looking at a year out here? So a year out, I mean, you definitely want to be as strong or stronger on that operative leg than you are on the non-operative leg. Right. Um, where, when we look at like return to play testing, that's the, bear with me here. Cause this is a really controversial topic in the PT world. Um, but where they'll typically clear people for return to some sport activity uh, is something like a 90% strength index of the um, non-operative leg. Um, I, I think that's a little misleading. And the guys I worked with at Champion kind of hated that metric as well, uh, because there's a lot of things that go into like comparative strength, one leg to the other. Um, if it's your dominant leg, we expect that leg to be stronger. So really what they were shooting for when I was working there was at least 100% if not greater, why not be stronger than the non-operative leg, right? Um, So you want to build up a lot of static strength, which is a lot of boring strength work, right? You're starting with simple exercises like uniplanar motions, um, things like, uh, you know, uh, quad sets and getting the quad firing. And then you're getting more and more complex all the way up to squats, up to lunges, up to more and more dynamic movements. Um, Once they can really, really uh, demonstrate great strength on that side. Now you have to start developing power, right? Um, which is what athletes need. It's how quickly can you develop that strength and create motion, right? So there's a time component as well. Um, that's the next big step. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's going to be very different for everybody based on what the injury was. Um, and it's going to be very different based on, uh, you know, how, how well the recovery goes. Sometimes it just does not go well. You know, you look at uh, like uh, David Bakhtiari, who had that continuous swelling on the knee that really, really uh, limited his ability to effectively rehab, I think, and then as a result, effectively get back to the field. I wanted to ask about David Bakhtiari's injury kind of in the context of whether or not an ACL recovery process can just, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting this, just not work. It, does that ever happen? Sure. You just you, you have the surgery, you do all the right things, and your knee just doesn't get better? Yeah, and I think actually, um, it's funny you brought up Al Harris. I think that might be kind of an example of that, right? And we can talk about this a little bit later, too. Um, I have found a great study talking about big picture. What do return to play, what does return to play look like for NFL athletes, um, kind of on a, a macro level? But, you know, he never 
uh, effectively got all the way back to the field, right? He kind of had a, oh, I'm going to push here, I'm going to push there, but never really made it. And my, and if I'm looking at his injury, that's uh, still talking about Al Harris, that, you know, he had, um, I had it right here. Uh, so he had an ACL tear, but he also had an LCL tear. Uh, the IT band was involved, lateral hamstring was involved. Um, so there was a, it's, it's usually, I think, those more complex injuries that are tougher to come back from. Um, and that's probably what happened with David Bakhtiari. You know, we never get the full story until, you know, five, 10 years later and the guy's retired. Um, but I, I think that's probably the case with David Bakhtiari, that we weren't looking at a straight ahead ACL tear. There was some other stuff going on. Okay. So it's, it is, I feel like that's something people don't necessarily want to hear sometimes is that sometimes you just guys don't get better. And, right. and there's not really a question attached to that. It's just sometimes that if I'm understanding you correctly, that's just how it is. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can dive into it now if you want. Um, but I have a, a great study I found that kind of outlines like how, how many of these guys are getting back to the field a, and then to the level they were playing at prior. Um, and it's, it's, it's not great. <laughs> yeah. Tell me um, about it. What do you know? Yeah. So let me pull up that study here. Um, we had a study called return to play and performance after primary ACL reconstruction in American football players, a systematic review, right? Systematic review being like the highest level of what, what evidence. That's a very strong study and that's gathering data from lots of smaller studies. Um, these were some of the highlights or I guess lowlights, if you want to call it that. Right. Um, so they found, uh, let me pull that up. Um, so the rate of return to play after ACL reconstruction for NFL football players was 67%, right? Meaning that 33% of those guys, a third of those guys uh, never make it back on the field, right? So that's already out of the gates, not awesome. Um, and I think uh, probably lower than we would, I expected certainly before I read that study. Uh, and then another thing they say is, um, uh, so they looked at like outcomes measured in general, and this was a little tough because the smaller studies use different metrics, but they said uh, pretty definitively, a majority of football players experienced greater declines from their pre-injury performance uh, compared to controls over the same time period. So even the guys that did get back to the field uh, were never able on the, on the whole to get back to the levels that they played at prior to the injury. I think about that with Jordy Nelson a lot because he came back in, and I think this is kind of misleading. Uh, he came back in 2016 and had a great year statistically, uh, like you know, well, 1,200 yards, almost 100 catches, 14 touchdowns. But by 2017, I think it was pretty clear he wasn't the same player, uh, and and he just he wasn't the same guy. The explosiveness wasn't there anymore. It seems to align just anecdotally with what you're saying. He declined faster than what you would have expected for a guy his age. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think that's something that um, I mean, even, you know, even in the best case scenarios, these guys are missing months of uh, high level strength training. They're then missing uh, months of high level uh, play, which is, you know, the most specific that they can be to their sport. Right. When they are in season and they're just playing all the time that is when they're in like the, the highest uh, readiness for football, right? Kind of maybe that's intuitive, but <laughs> um, if we think about like the, the training that goes into that and when they miss a season of play, that's a huge thing for them, right? Especially if these guys, uh, you know, they've been playing steadily from high school, college, all those things. Every year they have this reliable season that really works them really, really hard. And that's probably where they've made a lot of their linear improvement to that point. If they go and miss a season, um, that's a big deal. I think sometimes it's hard for us to kind of wrap our head around that. That kind of leads me, and maybe this is a, a, a bad time to set this up when we're talking about yeah. long-term improvement, but Rashawn Gary, he's heading into his second year post-ACL recovery. Is there anything to the idea that year two is better after ACL surgery? I've heard that anecdotally a few places. Other people, even on this podcast, have told me that that's, that is pretty real. Uh, in yeah. your estimation, is that true? Yeah, I, I would I would tend to agree with that. I think um, I, uh, we're just starting to kind of wrap our heads around just like how long term those strength deficits can be. Um, you know, a lot of studies at this point detailing how how uh, kind of prolonged that that operative leg can be weaker than the non operative leg. Um, I had a couple studies that I sent you over at some point. They were talking about like 
Um, so this was a big group by a uh, big study by Janssen um, et al from 2003 that found that patellar tendon ACL repair patients, so the, the type of surgery we're talking about, um, produced about 79% of the quad torque produced by the unaffected leg at a one year follow up, right? Meaning they're still 20% weaker on that operative leg one year out. So this is not professional athletes. So it's not an apples to apples comparison, right? Where, where these guys are very, very dialed in on those metrics, I'm sure, right? Um, but I, I think it is helpful to kind of get a sense that we are just typically not as strong following a surgery um, as we were prior. Uh, and that's a big deal. You know, even the guys that get to 100%, well, it's not till they get to 100% that they're really pushing all their agility work, that they're really pushing all their return to play work, that they're really pushing all the on-field activity, right? So it's a long time for them to be out of the game, literally. Um, and it takes a long time to get back to game speed, right? We talked about, you know, sometimes guys coming back from injuries, you know, it takes a couple of games for them to kind of shake off the rust. They start to look better over the course of a few games. I think that's a very real effect. Um, and it's not probably until they've had that second full off season of true strength work, right? There's no rehab work at that point. It's just true strength work. They're back in the gym, no limits. Um, and then they get to ramp back into the season like they normally would, that I think they are, are closer to that 100% mark. Do you think that's an explanatory thing for what, from the outside looking in, looked like a little bit of a decline for Rashawn Gary last year over the course of the season? Kind of looked tired, a little gashed at the end of the year? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think it's... Um, from a layperson's perspective, sometimes it's hard to grasp just how well conditioned these guys are, right? Um, it's it's like so much work that goes into building up that that tank um, prior to the season. And if they, he hasn't had the same runway going in because the first half of that offseason he's rehabbing his injury, um, he's just not going to look the same, right? So I, I think I think that absolutely uh, kind of helps hopefully explain some of that decline. Stepping but, back, hey, it could have been a scheme thing too, right? Could yeah, been, absolutely. Could have been and <laughs> you know, just going to throw him in a different scheme here this year and see if, if things yeah. change anymore. So, right, uh, right. It, it does make me a little bit concerned for him heading into this kind of stretch of his career and his second contract. You know, coming off an ACL now, heading into a different scheme again. Uh, we're, are right. we going to get the full experience from Rashawn Gary? I think he's putting in all the work, but you just sometimes you just never know. Right. And so I will say from that study we talked about earlier um, uh, about the, the return to play levels, right, and only two-thirds of the guys ever getting back to the field, it tended to be the case that higher drafted guys um, returned to the field at a higher rate and did better long-term compared to their prior metrics than lower drafted guys. And that one I thought was kind of interesting. I mean, one thing we could take away is maybe the team and, you know, the team around that guy is more invested in seeing this guy really succeed after that surgery, right? So there's just more, you know, time and effort going into that recovery or more leeway to getting him back on the field. Um, but I, that does make me hopeful that, you know, a guy like Rashawn Gary, freak athlete, highly drafted, you know, a linchpin of our defense is, is going to get all as close to or beyond 100% as he possibly can get. Kind of wrapping up, looking more broadly at, at ACL injuries and recovery, where is the kind of the frontier of this field? What's the bleeding edge of ACL recovery and where is this whole thing going? Yeah, uh, so it's it's <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I would say that, um, you know, we, we've kind of just, I think, gotten to the point where in the professional athlete world, we are now all doing the same surgery, right? Everyone's getting that patellar tendon autographed. Um, whereas like you said, even Aaron Rodgers in college, you know, was getting an allograft. I think that's not the case anymore. Um, everyone's getting the same surgery. Uh, rehab is really not standardized at this point, right? Um, you go 10 different uh, surgeons, you're gonna get 10 different protocols. Uh, and then you bring those protocols to a PT and you're gonna get different, uh, uh, different exercises, different rehab, right? And part of that is everyone's trying to tailor it to the player, to the injury, everything like that, and then to the demands that they're going to put on that knee going forward. Um, but, the, but the standardization of that, I think, um, is something that, that really could improve over the next decade. Um, part of that being that I think we can push, um, I think we can push harder than maybe we have in the past. Uh, there's, there's kind of more research emerging that, um, uh, rehab uh, medicine to some extent underdoses exercise, right? Uh, you don't, you 
don't want to be the guy that has Rashawn Gary in front of you and you retail tear that, that ACL in rehab, right? That is worst case scenario for a professional PT, right? Um, but, uh, but we definitely need to make, make sure we're doing enough, right? We can't be underdosing these guys, especially as you know, with the demands that they need to put on those knees going forward. So I think, um, kind of realizing how hard we can push in, in rehab is something that's kind of expanding and becoming more well established. Um, uh, but it's, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, I'm hopeful that as, as we continue to have more research available to us and we continue to uh, apply that research better, uh, these, these outcomes will only get better and better. This might be pie in the sky or something completely unrealistic, but is there ever a point where we could see ACL recovery? Say you have a Tyler Davis who tears his ACL in July. Is there ever a point where a guy could tear his ACL in training camp and come back in that same season? Oh man. Um, would be nice. Uh, <laughs> what I'll say is I, I think the big limiting factor is just the physiological healing timelines, right? Like we talked about those bone plugs taking 12 weeks to fully bond, right. And, and to be able to be stressed, uh, really vigorously. So I think there's a, there's a certain amount of, you just have to wait for the body to heal. Right. And during that time you're getting weaker, you're getting slower, you're getting stiffer. Right. Um, so it, it, there's a certain amount of the, the human body only heals so quickly. Right. Um, so I think that's probably the big limiter right now. Um, I don't, I, I'd be hopeful that in the future, when we get guys back in that first year, they're, they're stronger, faster, um, and more prepared. But, uh, is that timeline ever going to get faster than a year? I, I'm a little skeptical, but who knows? Maybe let's end it right here thinking about maybe prevention if you can't speed up the recovery timeline is there anything guys can be doing to prevent injuries like this that we aren't doing right now yeah big time that's a huge area of focus in a lot of uh professional leagues in a lot of um uh in a lot of even amateur leagues um a really good great place to dive into the research if anyone's interested on this is in australia there's a lot of pts looking at rugby teams and acl um injury prevention the biggest thing they're typically focused on is really, really strong hamstrings. Um, and that kind of gets back to the biomechanics of the joint. Um, but if you have really, really strong hamstrings, they kind of help support the ACL, do the same job as the ACL to some extent. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, looking at really, really uh, vigorous hamstring strengthening as, as a way of um, uh, kind of preventing some of those injuries. And then looking also at glute med strength. Um, so basically just looking at, at uh, strength of the hip, strength of the knee um, to try and provide muscular stability. So we're not just relying on that passive stability of the uh, ACL. Related to that, is there anything to the idea, concluding with David Bakhtiari here, about playing surfaces impacting ACL injuries? So good question. From what I saw, um, and I, you know, I hate to uh, back the owners on this one, not usually a pro owner guy, <laughs> but uh, the data kind of backs them up that there's not a big difference. Um, uh, that said, I mean, these, you know, these, these guys are asking for fields that feel better to them. There's certainly the bankroll to do that. Why we haven't done that. I just beyond me. A big thanks to Matt for sharing some of his knowledge with us today. We appreciate his work, and hopefully we can avoid having him on again because the Packers will just go on an unprecedented run of knee health uh, over the next, well, let's say 15 to 20 years, and no one is going to ever have this problem again. But in the real world where we actually live here, I know we'll probably have to talk to Matt again, and I'm confident he'll be able to give us some great information on what's going into the Packers' injury issues if and when they arise again. So I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I'd appreciate it even more if you'd take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. It's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. 